describe who you are and what you are you mean so much to us God but Lord you showed your love to us by sending your son and he died on the cross for our sin and we thank you so much freedom in that in that act so much love in that act so much liberation in that act we are allowed to do what we do for the kingdom because of what you did we don't take that for granted so we will bless you God we will bless you we will bless you Lord Lord have your way in our lives have your way in this service and we'll give you the praise. Yes. Amen, amen. You may take your seats. It is so good to be in the house of God one more time. And it's so good to see the Bookers. Mother Booker, Pastor Booker, it's so good to see you. God bless you, God bless you. And again, the Estelle family, Pastor Estelle and his wife and his children, it's good to see you. And uh, you know how God works mysteriously. Uh, I was in, in, in uh, getting ready this morning, and I was thinking, you know, I haven't talked to my Auntie Ella in quite some time. I'm going to call her after church. And then I walk outside. Here she is, all the way from Texas, super, along with Cousin Willie. And if y'all don't know Auntie Ella, that's, that's Lady BJ's sister. Amen. 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 And it's good to see you, Lady BJ. We honor you today. God bless you. God bless you. I won't be before you long. I know probably y'all, some of y'all haven't had any breakfast yet. Getting to, getting to church. You, you ain't had it yet? Okay, so. Hey, there's nothing worse than a ravenous preacher, so we're going to make sure that Pastor Estelle gets some breakfast after not too long. Amen. I've been doing a series on family, and God has pointed and put in my heart that it is important that we don't forget what family is all about. Amen. And when we look at family, so often... We just get the good picture, or we, or we only want to present the good picture. And, you know, no, no, we're all victims of that. We've all done that. You know, I remember uh, <laughs> being a kid, and I, I'm sure some of you children can attest to this, how your mother would be yelling at you and stuff. And, kid, I told you to do this. And then the phone rings, hello. <laughs> like, wait a minute, how you switch like that? <laughs> Y'all can attest to that. But the truth is family is so important. It's so important for our encouragement, 
and for our propelling into the future and, and legacy, all these things are connected to family. Now, why do you think that we have so many problems in family? Have you ever asked yourself, have you just scratched your head, why is there always something going on in my family? How come it's always some kind of dysfunction? How come it's always something in the family? The reason is because the enemy knows that when a family that is praying together, staying together, going to church together, do doing God's work together, he, his, his, his kingdom is, uh, is, is threatened. So he's going to do everything he can, everything he can to destroy relationships and family. And it seems like there is no kind of vehemence that is worse than brother-sibling rivalry or father against son, mother against, it's nothing worse because you know everything about that person. And the, the areas you need to cover, you expose because of the offense. So Satan is very crafty. Now, when we see and experience dysfunction in our family, and see, we just got to be real. It got to be real. And I've been saying that word a lot, dysfunction. Why is he saying dysfunction so much? Why do you got to bring that up? The problem is when we don't face those things, they'll slap you in the face and you won't know where it is. If you don't face those things and give them to the Lord, Lord, I got dysfunction in my family. Lord, you know it. Lord, I have a problem with my sister. I have a problem with my brother. I got a problem with my wife. I got a problem with my husband and I'm giving it to you, God. When we do that, God can work. God can show his power, his purpose in your life, in the life of your family. But yet we wrestle, we grapple with this fact that it's just, it seems like it's just never right. It's like you're doing a dance, one doing the tango and, and the other's doing the electric slide. It's like, wait a minute, we just can't get together. But we have to understand that the issues that we have are not uncommon. When we read the word of God, the word of God shows us so much dysfunction in families. So much dysfunction in families. Last week we talked about Sarah. And the angels of the Lord came and ministered to Abraham and told him that the promise would be true. That I promised you, back in chapter 12, I promised you that you would be the father of many nations and you would have a son even in your old age. Now chapter 12, he was a little younger and it was something that was, okay, we can do this. Come on, Sarah, we got this. Then chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, Sarah gets frustrated. She gets frustrated and the frustration with God, with the promises of God. Now, 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 you can always juxtapose your life to the word. And that's a good way to read the word. Looking at the word through the lenses of where you're living and where you are in the world. Then it becomes more real to you. It's not just a bunch of thou and thithers. And, you know, and some people, I know some people, I can't read the Bible because there's too many thous and thithers. But when you get past those, that old English, or even get a... A, a modern translation, you can see the relevance of the Bible, the word of God that was written so many years ago, so many years ago, and it's still relevant today. So we see Sarah, her issue, her problem. Here I am, 90 years old, and I still ain't had no baby yet. Now, can you blame her? Can you blame her? No, you can't blame her. If, if, if somebody came in there and said that the Lord told them at 90 that they was gonna have a baby, Somebody came in this church today. What would y'all do? Um, 911. Uh, we, uh, we have a psycho here today. She needs help. But the truth is, at 90, even back then, it was something that was impossible. But we can never forget the promises of God. The promises of God will put you in a place 
that your faith will be tested. But you got to believe the promise, no matter what it looks like. So Sarah, even in her anguish, had, had, had uh, ushered and, and uh, allowed her husband to sleep with her maidservant, Hagar, to have a, to have a baby. Now, the problem with that is, and, and we can kind of relate to this, when God gives you a promise and it doesn't happen the way you want it or when you want it, we kind of help God out. You know, I'm going to expedite this. God's taking too long. Has anybody ever been there before? Let's tell the truth. Has anybody ever been there before? Everybody's hand should be just raised. Everybody. I want to see everybody. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> The truth of the matter is, when we don't believe the promises of God and we don't lean on his promises and we don't walk and act in faith and we don't understand that faith will have you looking foolish. Faith will have you looking stupid. Faith will have you looking like a dunce in the, in the corner with that hat on. But when you believe God, God's promises coming to fruition in your life is such a testimony to those who don't believe or who don't, who don't know God or who have had a problem exercising faith or even embracing what faith is. Here we see Sarah and the angels of the Lord ministering to Abraham. This was in the chapter last week, chapter 17. And Sarah laughed. She giggled. Surely you just, men of God, this can't be true. And I can kind of picture, you know, that little. And they're looking at, you're laughing. Oh, no, 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 I wasn't laughing. But understand this. Thank you, Sister Alicia. <laughs> understand this. When, when Sarah came to understand that or to think that her promise was not going to be fulfilled, and putting the, the, the promises of God in her hand and, and allowing Abraham, now, now understand what, just, what is happening. What she's doing is taking a shortcut, a shortcut from God's promise, from what God's purpose and his, and, his, and his plan for her life. Sometimes we take shortcuts and we don't need to take shortcuts. Sometimes we just got to go through the process. So what we find here is a painful shortcut leading to a picture of dysfunction. Can y'all say that with me? A painful shortcut leading to a picture of dysfunction. Amen. Let's go to the word. Genesis 21 verse 8. And it reads, and the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which had, had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in, in thy sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the, of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the child and, and, and her and the child sent her away and he sent her and the child away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle. 
and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down over against him a good way off, as if it were bow shot. For, the, for, for she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, what aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thy hands, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes and saw a well of water and went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. Now to give you some context of this, Ishmael was about 14 years old. So he had been living in the house of his father for 14 years before his little brother came. And all of a sudden, when that little brother came, Sarah done changed her mind. Now, we really don't know the story. We weren't there. We, we don't know the intricacies of the story. It could have been that Hagar was throwing it in Sarah's face. I don't know. You know how we do sometime. I have his baby. You can't, you, you pregnant yet? Oh, you're not? Okay. We can be so cold. I don't know that I'm just kind of using my sanctified imagination. Cause I, see, I know how people are. I know the word doesn't exactly say that, but I know how people are. But anyway, 14 years has passed and, and he's been in this household living as the son of the father of the house, having the, the privileges of being the son. Then all of a sudden, the, 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 the main, his main woman, his main squeeze, Sarah said, now that I have a baby, they got to go. Now that's funny how we take shortcuts. God has given us a promise. We take shortcuts and we find ourselves in a pickle and we don't want to own up to the problem that we caused, that we created. Here Sarah created a problem by giving her husband. Now first of all, I don't think there's a woman in here I don't see one woman in here who would give their husband to the maidservant. And if that's you, we need to come to the altar right now. <laughs> Let's pray. We get back to the sermon later. <laughs> so we have to understand that when God promises us something, we can't take shortcuts because those shortcuts will be painful. And they will lead to some kind of dysfunction. Now the beautiful thing in all of this, God's promises are still true. Abraham was torn. That's still his boy. There's nothing worse than a man and his wife and the, and the child and you're in the middle. That's tough. So Abraham had to grapple with this and say, this is my boy. I don't want to just kick him out on the street. Sarah was like, I ain't having it. She got to go. And the boy. Both of y'all. <laughs> Help me preach this sermon. <laughs> they got to go. Yeah, I know I messed up, but they got to go. So the Spirit of God told Abraham, don't be grievous. Don't, don't, don't trip, man. This is something that y'all did. But don't worry. I got you. Isn't that good about God? How many have experienced God's goodness even through our mess, even through our disobedience? What we have to do is recognize. Get it right. Get back on track. No, hey, so I'm, I'm, God, I'm sorry I took this shortcut. I'm sorry that my family is dealing with this. God's promises are true. So true that he told and, and, and gave Hagar in the wilderness. He gave her confirmation. Don't worry, that's still Abraham's son. 
And Abraham is my man. Abraham, I got him. And since I got him, I got you. And a great nation will come from your son. So we have the Arab nation. That's the sons of Ishmael. And they, man, and they, they paid over there. They got oil. They got all, I mean, I mean, I have friends who visited over there. They said, if you're a citizen over here, you don't even have to pay for gas. Can you imagine that? Just walk driving up to the pump and just, you know, I'm a citizen here. And you just fill up the tank. I had to fill up the tank for my wife. It was like $80. I'm like, Lord Jesus. Can I get some of that uh, Ishmael blessing over here? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, even through the issues, even through the disappointment, even through the shortcuts and the, short, and the paths and the pain that we walk into, the pain that we create, God still has a promise for you. Now, I see that we, we all are here. We all come from families. Some of us have issues to this day. And that's okay. Because if we've never had a problem, what did Andre Crouch say? If I'd never had a problem, how would I know that God could solve? The only thing that we have to do, how we have to align ourselves, is to be in a right state with God. Amen? Amen. A right state with God. So, everything we see, Abraham going through this uncomfortability, this position that he's in, of being torn between wife and his son, everything we see, God shows him three things. One of the things he says to him is to leave his grievous mistake behind him. To leave his grievous mistake behind him. How many mistakes have we made? Ooh, we'd be up here all week. I'm just talking about me. I ain't even talking about y'all. <laughs> mistakes that we've made, and the problem is we still live in the mistakes. Me being a father, me being a husband, I haven't always got it right. I've made some mistakes. I've done some things that were, that were hard to deal with because of my stupidity. But I can't live there. I can't live there. I can't live there and neither can you live there. And isn't it funny that God told him, leave your mistake there. I got you. Didn't I, I, I told you I got you. I'm going to make it right. Now, so when I say mistake, by no means am I referring to Ishmael as a mistake. Sometimes we hear, you know, a baby born out of wedlock or in an untenable situation, and we say, oh, this is my mistake. Baby's never a mistake. No, Ishmael was not a mistake. The mistake was... Sarah and Abraham circumventing the promise. We have to understand that when we circumvent God's promises, when we circumvent it and don't go through the process, then that's the mistake. And we don't know how it will come, how it will, what kind of uh, uh, retribution we will have for that. So understand, we're not alone in this. Don't live in your mistakes. Don't live in your past in those places that, that you're ashamed of. The truth is, if the, if the cover was taken off of our lives, we'd all be running for cover. Just like Adam, when he found out he was naked. Ain't no different. But God is so loving, so forgiving, so uh, uh, such a res restoration a uh, 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 relationship with God that he sees past the mistakes and we have to embrace that stop looking at our, our mistakes as a way to navigate our future stop looking at our mistakes as this is it we've all made mistakes can you you probably don't remember but you know we all were babies at one time and when we walked for the first time Sometimes we tripped because we did a mistake and we fell. But can you imagine if we stopped there? We would have never learned how to walk. 
would have just been there. You got to keep on getting up and trying again and trying to make it right, trying to seek God, trying to be in his presence, trying to stay in his presence, trying to practice his presence. Amen. Number two, to leave in God's hands the responsibility for working things out to a satisfactory solution to both the innocently wronged and to the, 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 the repentant wrongdoer. We see God fulfilling this in verse 18. Let's look at verse 18 real quick again. I'm going to read that one more time. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, and I will make him a great nation. We're reminded there that in spite of the circumstance, I'm still God. I'm going to work it out. We have to leave it to God to work it out. So as you pray for your family, as you pray for that, that relationship that has been marred, that relationship that has, that has come to a stop, pray that God's will be done in that and believe God to do it. Don't try to take no shortcuts. Don't try to take, uh, 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 don't try to do it and put it in your hands because you're going to fail like Sarah did. Number three is that this scripture, this passage reminds us that we have to renew our faith in God's promises for our life. When we can just focus on the promises of God in our life, then we don't have time to wallow in our past and the mistakes that we made. Understand that Satan is going to, he's the accuser. That's what his name is, he's the accuser. Oh, see, yep, you did it, yep. I don't even know why you're going to church. Man, when you come into church, you're just going to turn into a ball of flames. And, and we believe that. He don't have the power over you like that unless you give it to him. Understand the power that we have to change our atmosphere. Understand the power, the power that we have when we're in the presence of God and connected to his spirit. He doesn't look at your shortcomings. He doesn't look at, at how you got it wrong or how you made a mistake. But when we make excuses, remember Adam's excuse? It's that woman you gave me, Lord. See, if you made her right, Lord, I'd have, see, it's all on you, God. It's your fault. The audacity to blame it on the creator. But that's human nature. We don't like to be wrong. We go to our grave not saying sorry. Be on your deathbed. He's, Do you forgive me? No. <laughs> that's dangerous, y'all. I want to encourage you today to walk in the freedom that God has for you. Amen. Let's stop taking those painful shortcuts yeah. and just go along for the ride. Look, if you're uncomfortable, God knows. Give it to him. Sing a song that gives him praise. Yeah. Isaiah 61 says, with the spirit of heaviness, I put on a garment of praise. Yeah. You ever been heavy? Yeah. You ever sung when you was heavy yeah. and that heaviness lifts? Yeah. Even if you can't sing, yeah. sing anyway, because yeah. it's joyful to God because he knows where it's coming from don't let don't let that excuse because you can't sing like Norma Handy you can't sing like brother Damian Willis or sister Karina's you can't sing like them or sister Kennedy I don't want to leave you out she like he didn't say nothing about me you know what I got you sister we need you sister Kennedy amen amen but I want you to be, encour be encouraged today. There's family breakdowns right now. Family breakdowns right now. And it's stopping us from moving forward and doing some great things. We need to realize that God is using us. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And as we are the sheep of his pasture and his people, there are some people out there that aren't his people. There are some people out there that are lost and they see us in the church fighting one another. Families not coming together. And what is it? It becomes a social club, a country club. 
God forbid this place become a social or a country club. This is a house of worship. This is a house of God. This is a house where I get my breakthrough. This is a house where I can put my, my burdens at the altar. This is a house where I can come and pray for my family. And I can give my dysfunction to my fam to, to God. I can give my dysfunction and everything to him and say, God, work it out. Like you worked it out for Abraham. You told him don't be grievous, but I'm going to work it out. That same God that worked for Abraham, he'll work for you. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we thank you. Lord, we come before you today. Gleaning from this message that we need to walk away from our past mistakes. Lord, the accuser is coming to try to give us a scarlet letter. But we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Because when I am in you, I'm a new creature. And I'm created to worship you. I'm created for your purpose to be fulfilled in my life. And Lord, we don't want anything to come between that. Forgive us, God, for not making it right in our families. And Lord, I ask that you would encourage us to reach out to that wayward son, that wayward daughter, that wayward uncle, father, mother, whoever we're connected with, no matter the issues. And Lord, you know, sometimes we've gone through some things that have been pretty, pretty bad. But Lord, you called us always to do the right thing. And Lord, just give us your grace and your love that we would be led by it, that your spirit would lead us, that your spirit would take control of our mouth and what we say, that we would spew out love instead of discord, that we would spew out encouragement instead of discouragement. God, we learn from the scripture today that you're still God no matter what we go through. No matter how we step outside of your will. No matter how we try to be God. You are God. So Lord forgive us. For that God complex that we walk in sometimes. Relieve us. Lord that we can just let it go. Give it to you. Father God we thank you. We thank you Jesus. We thank you, God. Now, Father, there are some people in here who are hurting, who are on the fence, who have not given their life to you, who are wrestling with their past life and thinking that their past life will preclude them from coming into the fellowship of you. That is not so. That is a trick and a lie from the enemy. Lord, you said, whosoever will, let them come. And so, Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would touch the hearts of those who are on the fence. Believing the devil's lie. Lord, give them spiritual blinders and muffles so they don't hear the enemy. But that they would focus on you. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would save them. That they would surrender their life. Lord, you know we're in COVID, so there's different protocols. But you can save wherever. And that's what's so good about you, God. You didn't make this rocket science. This is a simple gospel. A simple gospel. And if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that you died on the cross, not only did you die, but you rose again and that you are our savior the one and only savior of the world if we believe these things we're saved and lord as we're saved through the act of your spirit i ask that the gift of the spirit would fall on us that we would walk in his in his guidance that we would walk 
with steps that are pleasing you and that we would do everything we can to please you but we can't do it without your spirit God so we need you God this morning touch us this morning touch us touch us God and Lord, as you fill us with your spirit, as we've confessed and as we're proclaiming salvation, give us that courage and boldness to step outside of these walls and do damage to the devil's kingdom. Lord, you've equipped us with your spirit so we can do damage to the devil's kingdom. So many broken homes. So many displaced children. So many fatherless children. Lord, let us, let us be a church that gives attention to these things that are going on in our community. Not just attention, but resources that we can help. So much, oh God, that you're calling us to do. And we thank you for calling us. We feel privileged that we're called. Because you didn't have to, but you did. But Lord, let us get busy. Put the fire of the Holy Spirit under us. That we will not be comfortable just sitting down on the pew. Sitting down on our couches looking at HBO. That our comfort would become, that our comfort would come in uncomfortability. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah.